and welcome to another episode of Take 10. Today I'm joined with the terrific bass trombonist Jim Markey, who is the bass trombone of the Boston Symphony. And also he is the head of brass at New England Conservatory. But not only has he been the bass trombonist of one of the best orchestras in the world, he's also been one of the best tenor trombonists in the world as well when he was with the New York Philharmonic. So thank you very much for coming today and welcome, being a part of this. My pleasure to be here, Matt. So like I just said, you've been a part of a lot of different orchestras, uh, so can we talk about your audition preparation? Do you have anything that you do specifically to help you get ready for an audition? Sure, absolutely. The first time I had audition success was for the Metropolitan Opera's principal trombone audition in 1994, and I was runner-up. Nobody wants to be runner-up, but I was glad to have gotten to that point. It was the second audition that I'd taken. And I'd gotten there through a lot of hard work over the summertime and really honing the excerpts. The first time I actually, the, what I'd say, uh, the first real success I had in terms of winning a job was when I got the one-year position uh, with the Pittsburgh Symphony as principal trombone. And for that audition, it was a completely different experience. For the Met, I wound up having a, a list of excerpts, the excerpts were, everything was very well defined. You could isolate these specific bits, these specific kernels. For the Pittsburgh Symphony, I got a list of 25 pieces, and I actually got the list about three weeks beforehand. It wound up being a blessing in disguise because I thought, well, there's, there's no way that I can possibly learn all of this material the way I did for the Met. What I'd done with the Met was I'd, I'd looked at things, what I would say now, in the micro, looked at every tiny little detail to make sure every detail was sort of quite right. For Pittsburgh, I couldn't do that. I had to see the big picture. With Pittsburgh, while things may have been, at times, a little less polished, I did know the repertoire very well, so that when I played, I had worked very, very hard uh, with my teacher on having good, solid fundamentals. What I found since then, and what I teach people now, is excerpts are just illustrative. All they can do is illustrate what you can and can't do. No one ever got better playing an excerpt. And because of that, a stressing fundamental production elements of whether they be slide technique or how to play loud or how to play soft or high or low or fast or slow, those are all vitally important because all excerpts do is show whether you can do that. So because of the years that I'd had, the three years with my teacher at that point, working on that stuff, that when it came to the excerpts I actually had most of my technical ducks in a row. So then it was a matter of musically being able to show that I knew the repertoire and played in a convincing way, which when I knew the repertoire that became a lot easier to do. I wasn't so focused on the, the very fine details and saw the bigger picture. Now when I prepare for an audition I, and when I encourage my students to prepare, I encourage them to look at both. They have all of the pieces on their iPod or phone or whatever it is, their listening device, they have it loaded up and ready to go. And I encourage them to listen because Music is a language. Dr. Suzuki, the Suzuki Violin School, came up with this whole philosophy because he said, why are my students having such hard times with basic things like pitch and rhythm? Japanese is a much more complicated language than music, and all Japanese children learn Japanese. And he said, that's it. Music is a language. It really is. How do we learn languages? By listening. And so I encourage my students to listen to everything and listen to it multiple times. They know how the stuff goes. And then we make sure that in addition to the excerpt preparation that they have, that they also have the solid foundation and fundamentals, being able to articulate, being able to release, knowing how to play legato cleanly, whether it be across partials, whether it be on a single, single line. So these are the kinds of things that I work on with my students that I recommend and that I actually put into practice on my own when I do my own preparation for an audition. Now, where do you go for motivation or inspiration when you're in the daily grind of getting ready for an audition? Is there, do you have like go-to things? A lot of it boils down to your motivation for playing the instrument in the first place. We don't play the instrument in order to get rich. We don't play a trombone in order to be famous. <laughs> if you want those things, do something else. Why do we do it? Why are we musicians in the first place? I look at music as a gift. My faith, I look at it as a gift from, our, from, from a creator. But whether you look at it as a gift from a divine creator, or whether you look at it as a gift from the people who came 80,000 years before us and developed music, it's a gift when you see that. When you see that it is a gift, you realize that I get 
to play this. I get to do this. When you look at life in that lens, it completely changes your perception of what it means to go in the practice room. It doesn't mean it's always easy. Yes, there are times that going in the practice room is hard. Yes, there are times that it's challenging, that it's difficult work. And there are times that it's frustrating. But in the end, we get to bring this, what we do, to other people. We get to experience it ourselves, and we get to help other people experience it as well. And for me, that's about the biggest motivating factor I could have to want to do it. The gift and the fact that it's a joy to get to do. And that joy overrides everything. So like I said before, you also played tenor trombone for the, a large portion of your career. Now, what made you decide to switch to bass trombone? And did you have to do anything that you weren't aware of to actually get proficient on the bass trombone? That's a really good question. You know, it wasn't any one particular factor that came in in terms of me wanting to play bass trombone. It's, you're right, I spent a large portion of my career, but I'm actually getting to the point that I've spent more of my career on bass than I spent on tenor. I'm almost there, not quite there. I was at tenor trombones for uh, over 11 and a half years, and I've been a bass trombonist since April of 2007. So I'm coming up on 11 years now. In just six months, I'll surpass my time playing bass trombone uh, than I did on tenor. Now, that said, there are a couple of factors. First of all, I was the associate principal trombone in New York. And it's sort of like being a utility infielder on a baseball team. During the regular season, I was pretty busy. I would have, you know, sometimes I'd, I'd sub in for this, or I might play this position or that position. When the playoffs come, you're on the bench. And that's the way I found myself, is that when I go on tour, I wouldn't play a whole lot. And there were tours where I, there might be 11 concerts and I'd play five concerts. That's not what I wanted to do for the rest of my career. So that's one, one factor. But there's also the fact that as associate principal trombone, one of the things that I got to do was play bass trombone and cover for my predecessor, Don Harwood. There were times that things would happen. Sometimes they'd be expected things. He'd be off for a given week on a relief week and I'd have repertoire to play. And it wasn't uncommon for it to be something fun for me to do. I remember playing Manfred Symphony as one of my first experiences on bass trombone. Manfred for bass trombone is a fantastic part for us to get to play. Some early ex experiences include coming in for a last minute Shostakovich 8 on bass trombone, playing Ein Heldenleben. And actually this is kind of funny because it was on a horn that I'd never played before because the one that I usually played, Don had at home. Uh, and that was on about uh, an hour and a half notice because of bad weather. These are experiences you can't, you can't make up, but at the same time, they wound up being so exhilarating. And then there's the fact that just, I went through a long period on tenor trombone where I was just having trouble with my playing. I just was having trouble playing soft and high. And I'm honest and open about that, that you know, I thought, part of my thought was, well, if I move to bass trombone, I won't have to play soft and high anymore. Well, lo and behold, you know, as it turns out, Shortly before I wound up taking the audition, I figured out what I was doing wrong and now I can play soft and high. So soft and high just in time to play bass trombone. That's actually probably one of the reasons why I like taking advantage of the entire range of the instrument. I'm not stuck on the bottom. And ultimately, the bass trombone, it's, it's not that much different from a tenor. It's pitched in the exact same key. It's only 15 thousandths of an inch larger than a tenor is for a standard slide. If you're on a dual bore slide, you're only looking at an average of 23 thousandths which is less than half the difference between alto trombone and tenor. And alto trombone and tenor bore size is, is uh, yeah, more than twice the difference and it's pitched in E flat. So it's not like it's that different an instrument. It's got the second valve, which allows me all the fluidity and flexibility in the low register. And I feel like I've lost about a third off the top end of my range. I joke that it really is a superior instrument. <laughs> I really do think it's, it's a solid instrument, certainly worthy of being featured in solo repertoire. The thing is that I had to do, that said, I'm not going to minimize the fact that it is a different instrument. And we do wind up blowing it differently. It is harder to go from a smaller instrument to a larger instrument than it is to go from a larger to a smaller instrument, I think. And I experience that especially with Contra as well, when I go to Contra. I've gotten maybe more fluid with that, but when you're going from a smaller instrument to a larger instrument, generally speaking, at least in my experience, you're going to find that your sound is going to be generally hollow. It's going to lack core unless you be able to play loud, and then it's going to be raspy. It's going to be raw. And so you have to figure out how to get 
yourself to vibrate left to right in the lips in a way that's really going to fill out the mouthpiece. And honestly, it probably took me about two years to feel like the mouthpiece really was home, you know, as opposed to a tenor mouthpiece. The kinds of things, obviously, I had to get more familiar with how to use the second valve here. I opted for an independent system, honestly, because it gives me a lot more options. Anything in fifth position, which is sort of out of no man's land, I can now do in first position, or a flat first position. I have a lot of options with an independent setup that I'm grateful to have those. As far as things I had to work on, I had to play Blazevich's. There's actually a great book, the Blazevich book, the special edition, which Charlie Vernon did for low range trombone. I actually think that's the perfect range for bass trombone because it's exactly where we want to playing. That might be, shall we say, the money register, but we also have to play probably over 90% of our notes, probably 95, are above low B flat. And so that book makes you play in that register so you can't get a hollow sound.